All right, well, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that we turn to Genesis chapter 3. And I need to come and get my Bible because it's down here somewhere. Let's see. Oh, yep, it's in my box and everything. Look at that. People make fun of me for my box, but that's okay. I want my Bible to last me a little bit more than a year, so I try to, I try to do that. All right, Genesis chapter 3. If you don't know where Genesis is, it's at the very beginning. I was joking this morning, we're going to go through the whole Bible. But we're starting in Genesis chapter 3. How many of you guys are happy today? You should be happy. Amen? Jesus is alive. He's alive. Genesis chapter 3. And I, I wanted to kind of start this morning, before we get into our scripture, I was looking up, you know, many of you have probably heard the, or been a part of the tradition, where the pastor or the worship leader will call out and say, he is risen. And then the church responds, he is risen indeed. And I wanted to look that up and just identify where that, that came from. And it comes from an old ancient Orthodox hymn called Christos Anesti. And the, the hymn goes like this. It says, Christ is risen from the dead by death trampling death and to those in the tombs granting life. That's pretty powerful. I'm going to say it again. Christ is risen from the dead by death trampling death and to those in the tombs granting life. Somebody say amen. Amen. We should be saying wow to that statement because how many of you know everybody will face a tomb one day? And the only thing that keeps us from that tomb eternally is what I just said. Death trampling death. How many of you know are thankful that Jesus gave his life so that we could have life with him forever? Now, the tradition was from this. 40, for 40 days after Resurrection Sunday, When you would run into another believer, that could be in the marketplace, that could be on the street, that could be wherever they would go. At that time, you weren't allowed to worship freely. You could not do what we're doing today. If, if, If we did this back then, you would have been killed, right? You would have been martyred. And so what believers would do is when they would be going through the streets or they would go through the marketplace, they would see someone or they would identify someone possibly or potentially as another believer. Maybe they knew it. Maybe they didn't, but how many of you know you can see, you know, Jesus in other believers, amen? You should be able to see Jesus in your life, amen? Amen. Anybody ever see that? Like, you're just going through your day, and you run into someone, and you're like, they know the Lord, right? You just know. And so when somebody would be, maybe they would be doing trades in the marketplace or in the street, they would identify, and they would see Jesus in their eyes. They would say, Christos Anesti, which means He is risen. He is risen. And their response would be alethos anesti, which means truly he is risen. And so they would go through reminding themselves for the 40 days after Jesus was raised from the dead, they would go through the market. They would say, Christos anesti, Christ is risen. Everybody say, Christ is risen. And then the person would respond, alethos anesti, which is truly he is risen. Everybody say, truly he is risen. And so here's what I would like to do. We we say this, and it sounds like if we can say things empty hearted, we can go through the motions and there's no power in that, right? But when that truth connects with our heart and comes out of our mouth, how many know there's power in that? When we speak it with our heart, when we speak it because we know it to be true and we declare that he is risen, how many of you know it may sound minimal, it may sound simple, it may sound like tradition, but trust me, when we say that, it sends tremors through the pit of hell. And the very things that you walk in with must bow their knee to the name of Jesus. And so this is much more than just tradition. We're not here for tradition. Some of you might have come because it's Easter. And the Lord wants you here. But he wants you to know him. And he's available. Amen? He's so available. We think it's hard to get to the Lord. It's not hard. He's already paid it. 
He's removed the obstacles. And so here's what I would like to do. I would like to say this. I'm gonna, we're going to say it three times. I'm going to say he is risen. And then I would like for us to, to respond with that sense of victory, the victory that he has over death. I would like for us to respond, he is risen indeed. Can we just do that? Yes. And say it like we believe it. So I will say he is risen. You say he's risen indeed. And let's just allow that to be our witness today. Can we do that? All right, here we go. He is risen he is risen. He is risen. Amen. Can we thank the Lord this morning? Amen. Let's pray. Wonderful Holy Spirit. Speak to us and reveal the majesty of the risen King this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 3. And I... I, I I want to start at verse 1. We're going to, we're going to go through this because I think it gives us the context. And many of you may be familiar with the story. This is the, when the serpent comes to man. But let's read Genesis 3, starting at verse 1. I'll read it to you. It says, now the serpent, everybody say the serpent. This is the devil. Was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, the serpent said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? I talked about the tree on Good Friday. And it was, I, I think it was amazing. It was, it was an awesome revelation for me of the power of, of when we look to the tree, the cross. But he says, has God indeed said. How many of you know only God indeed says things? Like when God speaks, we can trust that. We can trust that it is sure. People often don't indeed say things, right? Like I can be going through my day and somebody will ask, how are you doing? And you could be having the worst day in the world, but you could say, oh, things are good. That's not indeed saying things. Only God says indeed things. See, not indeed saying something is speaking something that the heart doesn't truly know. I, I've, I've actually witnessed this is even as, as a pastor when I, when I, I talk about the truth and, and, I, and I believe in my heart. And uh, for those of you that don't know, for about the last nine months, I've actually had con consistent pain in my body. And you pray, and you believe, and yet it's there, and I'm not dying. <laughs> let, let me break that spoiler. Let's just release that tension. Not dying. Praise the Lord. Although I did just turn 42 yesterday, and my, my body is aging. Well, we, will, we will agree with that. <laughs> we spent an hour Googling why, when you get older, do you have a specific smell or a scent? Why do you smell different? And, and I was like, and they said it starts at age 40. So if you're 40, um, welcome to the club. Cheers. <laughs> All right, moving on. But there's been this pain. And I always would preach and know God is our healer. Jesus is our healer, right? Do, does anybody else believe that? The Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. And I believe that. And I would preach this and I would say these things, and, and it wasn't being hypocritical, but I will say that now when people come to me and they have pain in their body, I don't just hear it and pray for them, I feel it. You see, it's one thing to know something, it's another thing to know it. And when we talk about the word of God, everything that God says flows from his heart. And everything that he says is indeed truth. That's why his word is truth. Everything that is here comes from his heart. And so when he speaks, he knows what he's talking about. You, you get with me? You, you're with me? Like, there's things that you may have grown up and you're like, oh, I know this to be true, but once you encounter it, it becomes the rubber meets the road. 
And so here comes the serpent and begins to make, bring a question of what God has said. Did God indeed say that? How many of you know that's what the devil wants to do to every person? There's things that you receive in church, in times of prayer, and then when things get difficult, the enemy will come in and say, did God actually say that? Does God actually really love you? I mean, look at your life. You're a mess. Did God really say? That is the enemy's strategy. Did God really say that? To get you to question what he has already indeed said. What God has said, it cannot change. It is truth. It is always true. All right, we got to keep going. But this is the reality. When the truth in the heart, when truth that is in your heart connects with the tongue, that is powerful. And so here comes the enemy. He comes to question what God has indeed said. Verse 2 says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. The first mistake that Eve made is she, she began to entertain a conversation with the serpent rather than talk to God. She, she never had to engage in this. She never even had to be in conversation. How many of you know sometimes we entertain the wrong conversation? Verse 4 says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. They were already like God. The serpent's lying again. Verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes. How many of you know that's how the enemy works? He entices through the eyes. And a tree desirable to make one wise. How many of you know there's only one wisdom? His name is Jesus. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. In other words, shame came in. Self-awareness came in. How many of you know that if we want to stay in his glory, we must be more aware of Jesus than we are of ourselves? If you want breakthrough in your life and you're coming into these doors and you are hopeless, stop looking at yourself and begin to look to the Lord. Because when your awareness, when you are more aware of him, that shame and that condemnation breaks. That was a bonus. All right. So they, they knew that they were naked. Now, I want you to notice these next, this next part. Here's, here's, here's humanity. This is where all the problems in hu human history, this is where it started. Sin entered the world. And from this point, there's 6, there's been 6,000 years of wars, uh, murder, racism, poverty, sickness. This moment is the origin of all of that. And I want you to notice the best that we could come up with outside of the glory of God. And they sold fig leaves. They, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. This is the best that we can come up with. I'm going to try to hide my shame. It's still there but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide it. How many of you know you cannot hide from the Lord? Here is Adam and Eve, and they literally go from naming the animals to creating fig leaf underwear in a moment because they left the presence of God. They left the presence of the Lord. How many of you know, if you want to get dumb really fast, leave the presence of the Lord? The wisest people in the world love his presence. They want to be there. They want to sit in it. They want to dwell in that. That's what we find in the parable of the ten virgins, right? What was the difference between the five foolish virgins and the five wise ones? Some had oil, 
Some did not. The oil represents his presence. You want to be wise? Be a person of his presence who fights for it, who makes time in their day to be with him. How many of you know you don't need to even just, you, coming to church is not the only place that we should be in the presence of the Lord. No, Jesus says, well, no, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door because he's there. Jesus is our wisdom, amen? Everybody say, he is my wisdom. There is no wisdom apart from him. Oh, you didn't have to say that, but okay. <laughs> Verse 8 says, and they heard the sound of the Lord. Everybody say the sound of the Lord. What is the sound of the Lord? The sound of the Lord. Who, what is, who is the word of God? Jesus. The sound of the Lord is Jesus. Listen to this. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, they hid themselves, there's that shame, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God, Jesus, he calls to Adam and says, where are you? Now, how many of you know God was not playing a game of peekaboo? He knew where they were, but there was shame and they were hiding from the Lord. We do not need to hide from the Lord. But notice what happened here. They had missed their first appointment of fellowship with him. This was their, this was the, he, the Bible says, we are his daily delight. He wants to be with us, to spend time with us. And something happened where they stepped outside of the, of the Lord's glory. Shame filled their hearts. They were aware of it. And because of it, they missed their very first appointment with God. I heard a pastor once say, Adam was willing to move on without God forever, but God was not willing to move on without Adam. Verse 10 says, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. We can all relate to this. In other words, she did it. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. It's amazing how when we step out of the presence of God, we begin to deflect and point the finger. It's not me, it's them. You told me to walk in love, but I can't love them. It's, it's their fault. You see the way they are. God, you know, you created that. What are we? We're outside of his presence, okay. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Now, here's where I want to get. This is the first gospel message. Genesis 3. Actually, it's before that, but this is a big declaration of the gospel sermon. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between you, the enemy, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Everybody see the capital S? Who is that seed? That's Jesus. I will put enmity between your seed, the evil demonic forces of this world, and her seed, Jesus. He shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Another translation says he will crush you and you will wound him. How many of you remember the scripture where the Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquity. In a bruise is inner bleeding, right? It's under the skin, but there's bleeding that is happening underneath that skin. And in other words, it was an inner blood for inner sin. And so this was a mighty declaration of the resurrection. God is making it from the very moment sin enters the world, God will crush the devil in the resurrection. 
The moment that we stepped out of glory, the Lord fully committed himself to bring us back to glory. That wasn't good enough. The moment, have we all made mistakes? Each one of us, right? The Bible says there is no one righteous. The moment we stepped out of his glory and we turned our back on him, the Lord fully committed himself to bring us back into his glory. That's what we celebrate today. Now look at Genesis chapter one. We're going backwards. Genesis chapter one. This is the creation account, but there, within the creation account, there's so many prophetic statements that God is making. Verse Genesis chapter one, starting at verse nine, it says, then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place. Now that we think of the creation, we think of the ocean, the seas, right? But this actually also speaks of a life of worship and a life of prayer, how we need the attention, the waters of our heart to gather together to worship him correctly. And it says, and let the dry land appeared. In other words, we have nothing to stand on until our thoughts and our hearts are collected toward Jesus. And it was so, verse 10, and God called the dry land earth, and he gathering together of the waters he called the seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed, everybody say seed, seed. whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and listen. And so the evening and the morning were the third day. What did God promise when sin entered this world? My seed will crush your seed. This is what that seed with the capital S does. He breaks the earth on the third day. Amen? In Genesis 1, we see God, he is already prophesying of the perfect seed who would break the limitations of the grave and come out of the ground as the first fruits. Jesus is the first, right? This is powerful. Is this good? It needs to be. It should be. I, we, the Lord, we, I spent a lot of time praying on that. How many of you remember now? Let's go now to John. John 12. How many of you remember in John 12, the Greeks, they come and they begin asking questions of Philip, one of Jesus' disciples. And they're saying, hey, we, we want to we meet with Jesus. The Greeks came. They, we want to meet, want a meeting. And so the Greeks go to Philip, then Philip goes to Andrew, one of the other disciples, and then the two of them, they go to the Lord Jesus, and they say, hey, these guys, these Greeks, they want to they meet with you. They want to talk with you. And I want you to notice the way that Jesus answers in verse 23. How many of you know the disciples were often confused when Jesus was doing his earthly ministry, right? Like, they had no idea. Like, Jesus was like, hey, guys, I'm going to die. And they were like, what is he talking about, right? Like... What do you mean? Okay, they didn't, they didn't have the, they hadn't been filled with the Holy Spirit yet. There wasn't that. We have an advantage. But listen to how Jesus answers this. Hey, these guys want to meet with you. Look, listen to what Jesus says. Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. I mean, can you imagine the confusions? And they're like, Lord, they just want to know if they can get together for some coffee. And you're talking about seeds and grain and wheat? Like, what, what, are, we, what are we talking about here? 
Jesus was saying, listen, it's not time for them to meet me. One day I'm going to go into the ground as the seed. And I'll give my life as that seed of the Lord. And this, that seed will crush the head of Satan. And once his body was buried as that seed, as his seed went into the earth, the grave thought it had won. But the grave did not swallow a mere man. Instead, the grave swallowed a nuclear bomb who came to destroy the grave. This is why scripture said, if the enemy, if they had known what they would have happened, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. The grave thought it won, but Jesus is the one who breaks the ground and brings new life. Amen. And this is what we celebrate today. Jesus willingly laid down his life for our sins. He was buried. He defeated death. And he was raised to life again. And now Jesus is alive. Amen. He's the first fruits. He is birth. He laid his body down and he sprung forth life. And he is the first fruit. Amen. And now a great harvest is coming to anyone who believes in him. They would have that same life. Amen. His resurrection, let me say this, his resurrection is our resurrection. His life, to those who would believe, is our life if we will repent and turn from him. Now, what, is, what does it mean to repent? Repentance is not just saying, Lord, I'm sorry. That's confession. But to repentance is to turn from all and to turn to him. That means anything that would be after my affection besides him must be secondary. Good or bad. And that's so, we hear so often in the church. Well, it's not bad if I do this. No, it's not bad unless it's cooling your affection towards him. Anything that would seek to uh, uh, dominate your time or your attention or your heart besides him. That's why when we sing those words, you are my everything. You might hear phrases throughout scripture. He is my all in all. That means everywhere I go, he is in my thoughts. He is in my heart and I look for him. And so repentance is to turn from all and to turn to him. Listen to Acts 5, verse 30. It says, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. Notice, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. How many of you know forgiveness comes when we humbly repent and we turn to him? Remember, I said at the very beginning, he's available. No matter what you came in with, no matter what you hold, no matter what's been done to you, he's available. We just have to turn to him. That's repentance. How many of you know there, there's things that we need to repent for often? Because we get off. Even in the church, right? We get off. We, there's things that just consume us. And what started as a hobby became our addiction. What started as fellowship became a snare. Anything that is outside of him will ultimately lead to death. And that sounds extreme, but it's the truth. He is the way. Now, when we do things in his name and we are with him, that's a different story. That's when we actually experience life. That's when we can enjoy things without guilt, without shame, without bondage, without addictions, because we're submitted to him. How many of you know he knows what's best for you? He knows what you can handle better than you do. He knows what's good for you better than you do. And so when we say things like, 
repent and give your life to the Lord, what does that mean? It means that I'm literally dying to myself and I'm letting him have the say. I'm not gonna live for myself. I'm not gonna live according to my own desires, my own will. No, I'm gonna live according to what he has said. And even within that, he's going to help me make subtle adjustments to stay on course with him. That's why the scripture says he is faithful and just. He is committed to finish the work that he has begun. Amen. And so this is what his resurrection does. If we will repent, listen to what his resurrection does. Number one, it ensures your new birth. Your new birth. This is what it means to be born again. The old has passed, the new. You are a new creation in him. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, the old things die. Just as how he gave his life on the cross, when you give your life to him, that old self is nailed to the cross with him. Old thinking, old habits, old patterns. He's the king of kings. So whatever you are dealing with, it must bow to him. You're like, you don't understand. There's addiction in my life. If I give my life to him, that's not just going to go away. You know, it just might. And even if it doesn't, we commit to follow him and he will, he will complete the work. Okay. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. Is he merciful? Sometimes we say, I don't like God's way of doing things. We should be thankful there is a way. There was no way. There was no way to have eternity with him. As soon as Adam and Eve stepped out of glory, as soon as sin entered the world, the only thing that was in front of us was death and an eternity in hell apart from him. That's it. But he committed his son Jesus and he made a way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we think that we can justify ourselves. Let me tell you, you cannot justify yourself. You cannot clean yourself. You can't make what is dirty clean. Only the blood of Jesus can do this. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so his resurrection, it takes what was dead and it breathes new life into it. His resurrection ensures our new birth. If you have sickness in your body, how many of you know sometimes you need, sometimes you wish you could push that reset button and revert to that body that didn't have the pain, that body that didn't have that sickness, right? New creation, new birth. Here we go. His resurrection, number two, releases the forgiveness of sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Because Jesus has been raised, you can leave this place today free from sin. Amen. You can leave free from sin. You can leave free from religion. I hear that all the time. I'm not religious. I'm not asking you to be. Jesus isn't asking you to be religious. He's purely asking, will you fall in love with me? You can leave free today from shame, lifeless repetition, and the condemnation of sin. Number three, his resurrection destroys condemnation. If you are tired of walking around feeling guilty, listen to this, Romans 8.34 says this, who is to condemn? Everybody say that. Who is to condemn? One more time. Who is to condemn? Listen, the devil will try to point his finger and condemn you and talk you out of things. The world will point its finger at you and try to say, you're not good enough. You can't live like that. You can't do those things. No, God doesn't love you because you can't even keep your marriage together. Lies. Who is to condemn? Jesus healed the sick. Somebody say amen. Jesus delivered the oppressed. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus reconciled the prostitute. His resurrection destroys condemnation. If you're tired of walking around feeling guilty, it says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. It's done. 
more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. If you did not know this, I don't want you to leave here not knowing this. Jesus is not just some spiritual aura. He is a man. He's a second person of the Godhead who became flesh, who lived a sinless life, who was crucified, who died, who was raised back to life, defeating death, and he ascended into heaven 40 days later as a man, every say a man, and fully God. And he is right now seated at the right hand of God in heaven, praying for you. Sometimes we lose sight of these things. He's not an aura. He's not karma. I'll tell you that much. No, he's God. And he's alive. And he still has the holes in his hands. And he still has the holes on his feet. And he's praying for you. That you would know him that the lies that you have been told would have no more weight in your life. Whatever has talked you out of being with him, that that would break. If it's shame, it's shame. If it's lies, it's lies. Whatever it is, whatever that is not is keeping you from him, it is demonic. It is not the Lord. Scripture says, seek the Lord while he may be found. I used to think, I was like, Lord, why, why can't people just live their life and then when, right before they die, why can't they just give their life to you then? Certainly it could happen, but do we want to risk that? Because Scripture says, seek the Lord while he may be found. This world has a way of hardening our heart from him. And the more life that you live apart from him, almost the harder it is to receive him because you have picked up so many lies. You've picked up so much dirt. You can't even see your, the, your feet, right? You walk around in sandals. Anybody else like this? I, my feet get filthy by the end of the day. I have to wash my feet before I go to bed or my wife gets mad at me. And I agree. Oh, I mean that in the best way. Oh, if, okay, back up. She gave me a look. She does not make me wash my feet every day before I go to bed. <laughs> You're all like, what did you marry? No, <laughs> that's not, no, no. I choose to wash my feet because my wife, I think, would not appreciate a dirty bed because of my nasty feet when I get pick up dirt. Okay, we're going back. <laughs> Am I, did I recover? No. <laughs> mm. No. I like to wear shoes because it keeps my feet clean. <laughs> when you walk around though, barefoot or in flip-flops, by the end of the day, you've picked stuff up. And when we walk in this world and we are listening to the things that we listen to, we watch the things that we watch, we hear the things at school that we hear, we're picking things up. And all of those things are designed by the enemy to keep you from him, to cool your affection towards him. And all of a sudden, now you're thinking, I don't really need him. I'm just going to live my life, and then I'll come back. No, Scripture says, seek the Lord while he may be found. There's no guarantee of a tomorrow, amen? Amen. There's no guarantee that your heart will be in a place that you'll receive him because offense will come. Hurt will come. Jesus said these things. You will face many things. There will be trials, there will be tribulations, but what does he say? But fear not, I have overcome the world. He's overcome the world, amen? He's the king of salvation, amen? And so now is the time of salvation. Jesus, the seed of the Lord, 
has laid down his life. Can you think of the trust there? He is the Sabbath. He's our Sabbath rest. Jesus rested from his works when he was crucified and died and he laid in the tomb for three days. He took a Sabbath rest, trusting that the Father would not leave him there. That's what our Sabbath is. When he says, you should take a day of rest, what are we doing? I'm gonna stop from my work, thinking that I can do everything, that I can be my own God, and I'm gonna trust you with the work. Jesus laid down his life to crush the head of Satan. He defeated the grave, was raised to life on the third day, and now his resurrection is our resurrection to anyone who would believe, anyone, anyone. And the Bible says that the day is coming when the sky will rip open and Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. Amen. And on that day, we will all stand before him face to face. And we will stand before him in one of two ways. Number one, as his bride. Let me say it this way for those of you that are confused by that. We can stand before him as his reward. How many of you know the laying of his life deserves a reward? The church is his reward. We can either stand before him face to face as a, his bride, or we can stand to, uh, with him face to face as his enemy. There's no in between. And you can say, I don't like that, it's too bad. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to try to have a big church. Honestly, I'm not here to try to fill the seats. The Lord will do that. We have to know these things. And so what will you choose? If you're here today, and maybe you, you know the Lord, you gave your life to the Lord, but you're not walking with him, your heart isn't in love with him. I've had this conversation with people and I'm like, I get everything that you're facing, number one, Jesus is the answer. And you're like, well, no, my marriage is bad. Jesus is the answer. Well, no, my kids, they don't, they don't love the Lord. No, Jesus is the answer. What, well, what about the counsel? That they, can, they can be useful, but if Jesus, only if it comes from him. Jesus is the answer. How will you choose to face him? Because everybody will face him. If your love for him has diminished over time, repent from the things that have consumed you, whether it's making money, being successful, having a relationship that does not honor the Lord. Whatever it is that keeps you from him, repent and turn to him. Amen. If you have not given your life to the Lord, you have an opportunity to do that right now. Can we stand together? We're gonna close with this prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Just with every head bow, every eye closed, just begin to thank the Lord. Just say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for washing my sin away, for allowing your life to become my life, your righteousness to become my righteousness. Mm. Thank you, Lord, that you are here. I sense the Lord. I sense the Lord. If you're here and you are, have not given your life to the Lord, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you are here and you've not given your life to the Lord, I'm gonna ask that you look at me and just raise your hand and say, I would like to give my life to the Lord. You don't need to say that, just raise your hand. Amen. 
And if you're here and you're saying, I want more of the Lord, I want to burn for him, burn in my affection for him. I want him to be my passion. If that's you, just raise your hand. Amen. And so I'm gonna ask that we all pray this prayer out loud. I'm gonna ask that you repeat after me, just in a voice loud enough for the person next to you to hear. The Bible says, confess with your mouth. And so that's why we say this out loud. But let's pray this. Say, Father, I've sinned against you. And I know I've sinned. Forgive my sin. You promise me that if I would confess my sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Jesus, I declare that you are the son of the living God, that you came to the earth born of a virgin and lived a holy and perfect life. You were beaten, mocked, spit upon, ridiculed, and judged for me. You were nailed to the cross to pay for my sin. You bled and died upon that tree and you were buried to take my debt and destroy my grave. And you came out three days later, risen indeed, risen indeed, risen indeed. And you are alive as the son of God. And you ascended to the right hand of the father and you're seated there today, and you will return as King of kings, Lord of lords, to judge the living and the dead. And today, because of your love for me, I give you my life. I hand my life over to you. Come into my heart. I repent of sin. I renounce the devil. I renounce this world. I renounce its ways. And I give my heart and allegiance to Jesus. And in Jesus' name, I am born again and a follower of Jesus forever. Amen. 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 Can we thank the Lord this morning? Thank you, Lord. I want to encourage you if, you, if you gave your life to Jesus for the first time, don't let it stop here. I want to encourage you, number one, find a church that believes in his word, that is filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, be there. Be in his word every day. Pray regularly. Be a part of the fellowship of God. Amen. It's important. All right. Well, you are loved. He is risen. Very good. Very good. God bless you. We'll see you guys.